Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Windows 8 developer session, developer track. So Windows 8 developer track will take place in this room today and tomorrow. Uh, today, all the sessions in a track will be held in English, and tomorrow they're going to be held uh, exclusively in Finnish in this track. So if, if you're interested in English-speaking uh, sessions tomorrow, uh, there's plenty of them uh, happening in other tracks, so uh, make sure you take a look at your program and see, see where they're at. So, uh, without further ado, we are basically going to introduce you to the Windows 8 uh, design paradigms, design style of Windows 8, and introduce you to the concepts that have been coming to us with Windows 8, and what they really mean, what they are, and uh, how they work from a user interface and user experience design perspective. Um, we come uh, from Luxus, and uh, we are Marcus and Arthur, so Marcus in... Yeah, uh, I'm Marcus Jonsson. Uh, I'm a UX and UI develop, uh, designer and also do a bit of front-end coding at Luxus Helsinki. Uh, and I've done all kinds of stuff, um, both web and apps and uh, design of digital tools um, for marketing mostly. And um, I really like uh, improving the user experience and bringing the best experience to, to, to enjoy to use a tool. Yeah, hi, and I'm Artur Spolis. I'm a CTO at Luxus Helsinki. And my job really involves being on a crossroads between the developers, designers, UX uh, developers, or UX designers, as well as clients, and to make sure that sort of we all work towards a common goal to delighting our customers and uh, our customers' customers by making beautiful experiences that work as they should. So we combine essentially form and function together and that's not always easy, but we always try to, to make it, well, pixel perfect when possible and just make it work correctly. So, uh, uh, Luxus is a, is a world's smallest global digital agency. We have offices in Helsinki, uh, San Francisco, and Singapore. Uh, All together, we have around uh, 50, 60 people uh, globally. Uh, ranging from visual designers to developers, programmers. Uh, we have uh, people doing motion graphics, people doing uh, marketing videos, digital video. So we really span, uh, span the whole spectrum of digital presences, and we are extremely excited about uh, the opportunities brought by Windows 8, because really what we see here is a convergence of the whole range of devices from the mobile to the desktop and with Windows 8 and Windows 8 phone we see even more of that convergence happening. So this session is going to be about, about Windows 8 uh, design principles and what they mean when designing your app. So in today's uh, excellent keynote by Tim O'Brien we heard that the view is the very important part of your application. So the view is about how your users are going to use your application, how they're going to interact with it, and how they're going to you know, feel when they use your application, how easy or hard it is. So that's the part we're going to focus on. And uh, then hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers as well in the end of the session. So maybe to introduce Windows 8, uh, how many of you are using Windows 8 at the moment? So quite a few. Uh, still not everybody. I urge you to <laughs> download and uh, buy, the, buy the Windows 8 and, or ask your IT department to install it at your computers because it's quite an interesting uh, fusion of going from the traditional input towards the touch input while supporting all of them. We're going to talk more about that. And uh, just, just for the benefit of those of you who are still not using Windows 8, we're going to show the main features of Windows 8 vis-a-vis uh, -vis Windows 7 and how it has sort of evolved because it really, in terms of, in many ways it's an evolution and as well a revolution when it comes to touch-first uh, input and interface. So Marcus is going to demo some, some interesting user interface paradigms that we see in Windows 8. So let, yeah. I guess we need to change the screen. So for, for those of you that have been um, trying out and working with Windows 8, this is a familiar view. Um, and this is a start screen of, of the Windows 8 where you have your tiles um, and your live tiles. You, you're going to see that some of these are 
moving, hopefully, and switching content. And that's also a benefit that you, as creators of an app, can take to, to, to brand your app and remind the users what, what content that's new and what they have to, to benefit from, from uh, coming back, back to your application. Um, so in this view, we have all of the application that's pinned to the start screen. Uh, we can do a semantic zoom, zoom movement to, to get a bird's eye view of all of the apps that pinned. Um, and we can pin back. And this is a motion that's used in many of the apps to, to, to kind of navigate between sections of content and also something that we're going to talk more about later in this session. Um, we also have um, the, uh, the charms. So if we swi swipe from the side, we get the system settings and search charm. And that's also something uh, we'll dive, dive deeper into uh, later in this session and something you can use to, to get a consistent um, user interface and experience for the users throughout uh, the whole um, um, operating system. Um, that's basically what I have as introduction to, to showing you what it looks like just to, for you to get a, a view of, of uh, what we're talking about. So maybe some, some comments in terms of what we're going to be really delving deeper into. So you see here we are certain certain amount of spacing between the, icon, uh, between the tiles. Tiles can be smaller or bigger. You see certain kind of pattern emerging. So for example, if you fire up the cocktail flow application we saw earlier today, we can see some of the same patterns. So we see, uh, we see columns which are spaced in a certain way. We see a certain amount of padding which is consistent with what we saw in the star screen. So maybe if you, fire, if you, go, back to the, if you go back to the home screen of this app and do a pinch move of semantic zoom. So you see the same semantic zoom uh, gesture which you saw in the start screen. It works here. It works in an app. So a well-designed app utilizes the same interaction and uh, visual design paradigms as every other well-designed app, as well as Windows 8 system itself. So you have consistency across the board. And what we're going to be talking today is how, you, how this consistency comes about. What are the factors which allow you to build consistent apps, which are yet uh, actually unique, because here you see you're, you don't have boxes, you have these shaped elements, and if you click on any one of them, or if, sorry, <laughs> if you tap on any one of them, you will see a little bit of animation, so that animation brings the application to life. It's, it's not by accident, it's all part of Windows 8 design language, so uh, that's, that's really the, the content of the next, next section of our presentation. So the question we really want to ask you and want to ask ourselves when, when we're presenting this is why do you need to follow Windows 8 design guidelines? What are the benefits to you as developers when you do that? And hopefully during this session we're going to be able to answer that question. So first of all, we're going to go through the five principles of um, good app design. And this is something you can use as kind of uh, a um, structure in the bottom of when you think about uh, developing your applications. Um, it's a good five steps to kind of go through, uh, even during the process of the creation of the app, to remind yourself about what, you're, um, what you want to achieve. And the five principles are do more with less, uh, which basically means to focus on your content um, get rid of the unnecessary Chrome, um, the thing that, that uh, distracts the user from, from um, um, taking up your content that you're trying to convey. Uh, we have pride in craftsmanship. Um, that is a bit of what Artus just talked about, the um, alignment of, of, um, of items in the, the grid of, of your application so that the user can feel at home um, and... Um, easy scan for, for the stuff they, that really matters in your application. Uh, it also um, contains the fonts. We have the Sego UI font, uh, which is the default in Windows 8. Um, a great looking, really clean font that should be used to the maximum, uh, rather in, in big sizes, uh, so it's easy to find what you're looking for. We also have um, um, 
we also try to use bold colors um, to to emphasize, em emphasize um, the what we're trying to convey. Then we have B fast and fluid, uh, which is more about um, responding to user input. Um, users should really see that when they press something, something is happening. Um, if you not show this in some way, uh, and a user is really really seeing that they they expect something to happen, um, then they're going to lose patience and, in extension, close down the app and do something else. Um, it also contains the animation. So subtle animations is part of Windows 8, Windows 8 and something that should be used to, um, to indicate how to interact with the application. Uh, authentically digital um, um, is that we should break away from the physical meta metaphors. Um, a lot that we see in other mediums, the web and, and uh, iOS and um, Android applications, where we try to, to um, replicate what we see in the physical world. Um, and that's something we try to keep away from when designing Windows 8 applications. Um, it also contains um, staying connected to the cloud, uh, sharing the state of your application um, between devices. So a user should be able to move from their tablet or their desktop computer to their phone and have the same experience and the same data um, present. Um, and then we have Windows 1, um, reduce redundancy. Uh, take away everything that is not necessary. Uh, use the built-in Windows 8 functionality as the charms, as I showed you before. You can use the same search as any other application in Windows 8, so the user always knows where to find the search. You don't need to, to create a custom search box. It's not necessary because it's built in from start. The same with uh, social sharing. And uh, say you want to mail something from your app to, to uh, your friend. It's built in. Ju just use it. It's simple. Exactly. So we, we'll go through each one of these principles in bigger detail, maybe show some of the some of the things that matter the most visually we demo them in apps and uh, the first principle is is to really to do more with less yeah and this is one of the five the first of the five principles and it is basically about removing co chrome and focusing on the content that's that's the one thing i want you to really remember about this um and it is also, um, we should really try to, to get the users to feel confident about using your application and, and Windows 8 applications in general, because a confident user is a happy user that will come back and use your application more and more. Um, so what we're trying to, to achieve here by focusing on the thing that matters is to immerse the user in what they love. Um, and what they're trying to, to um, get out of your application. And once they're immersed in that one, they're going to explore the rest of the application by pure, pure um, pleasure. And it's just like playing on that, that rules. Um, it's also about not cluttering your app with, with custom controls, uh, custom search boxes, social sharing, and, and what I was talking about a little while ago. Um, Windows 8 has very, quite strict guidelines uh, compared to what we've seen in previous versions of the operating system. And this is something we should embrace and, and use the, the grid, for example, um, laying out everything that, so that the user feels at home. They feel the same structure in your application as the applications they used before. So what is your app best at? This is a good starting point uh, when, when trying to, to come up with a, a concept that's, that's going to hold your idea. And a simple way to do this is, is the best at, at statement. My app it's, is best in this category at. And it's something that should be really focused and narrow 
um, narrow enough to to place yourself as as um, as special in in the app um, ecosystem. A good idea is to write it down even on a piece of paper before you even start. You know, lying down the code, you just write down the statement. Okay, I want to be best here, and then you can use that statement to guide your development, to really ask yourself, okay, am I take, if I'm taking a step back from my best at statement, or, or I'm coming closer, and if you're working in a team, you can, you can have your designers, your, your UX developers also think about that. Yeah, it's something you can have as a measuring stick, so if you have a functionality that you kind of trying to, to see if it fits into your application, use your best at statement to go back to that one and compare it to it. And you'll quickly see if, if it's something that supports your best at statement or it doesn't. And this saves you time um, to focus on what's important in the development. At the same time, you can throw away all the alternatives which are probably not worth pursuing. For example, if you ask, okay, can I be the best at being a video player application? Most likely not, because there's a lot of video player applications out there. So you either want to become a specialized video player application. I want to be a best video player application for, for kids watching cartoons. You know, that's already a more detailed, more, more, focused, uh, more focused best ad statement that can give you a competitive advantage and uh, eventually more revenue from your users. So try to focus and try to see where you can realistically be best at something and where you already have a lot of competition out there. And content before Chrome, as I said before, is one of the key things about Windows 8. Um, and the thing itself that's going to change uh, the user exper experience most. Here we have two examples of one traditional Windows application and one um, Windows 8 application. And as you can see here, it's, they're both RSS reader applications. They, they have one focus, and that is to get the user to read RSS articles and feeds, um, and to do it in a, in a radically different way. Um, the traditional application um, has a pa panel layout, as we've all seen before. Um, you can select um, different RSS feeds. You can select which article you want to read, and you can mark, um, mark articles as read, and you can add new RSS feeds. And what we're left with is about 25% of space in the real estate that actually focus on the content, what we want to convey to the user. And this is something you can see is radically different in the Windows 8 application. We have a focus where we put big chunks of content on the screen, and we um, still have the same functionality. You can still add feeds, you can still mark as red, but we've just hidden it in the app bar, and um, the charms and in collections of um, RSS articles. So if you would, would be clicking on the business or entertainment headlines up there, it would take you to a collection um, of entertainment show articles. For example, if we... Downwards. If we fire... I think we, we don't have... You press it down. This one. Yeah. I just want to show the BBC app quickly. Uh, yeah, I'm not very good with this analog switch, so I'm oh, embracing the digital metaphors. <laughs> and the button, the button itself yep. didn't... Okay, cool. So basically what, what I wanted to show you uh, quickly is a, is a BBC app uh, which we have uh, downloaded so, and which shows this in a very, very nice manner. So basically, here, in a, it's, a, it's a news application. Uh, it follows the, the RSS reader pattern you just saw in a previous slide. So what we have here is a bunch of collections. So you can actually drill into any of those sections by, by tapping on a heading. And then you, s you, you are in that section, you get more of the content there. So in a way, everything is at your fingertips, but you're not seeing everything at once, and you're just using semantic zoom to go into those sections. Semantic zoom is kind of like a scroll bar, so you, oops. <coughs> so you basically just, you can 
get an overview, a bird's eye view of your content at the same time as seeing as little of the content on your screen at the same time, allowing you to focus. And we are going to go more through those principles later on in the talk, but just to, just to give a concrete example of what this, what this really means to the user. Yeah, but this really wraps up the content before Chrome um, thought. And um, yeah. And we have, we have actually a few, few examples of how to transfer a, a web page uh, into a, a Chromeless yeah. <laughs> application. So the bottom line is make your content shine. So just to go through, just to reiterate it, uh, so repetition is a mother of all knowledge. Let's say we have a website, and this is a food truck website. A food truck is a truck which goes around the neighborhoods to sell, to sell food. And uh, it, it, could have a GP, uh, it could have a geographical position, GPS coordinates, it could have pricing, it could have products, etc. It's just an example website for that. It's one of the design examples from Microsoft. So what we're really seeing here in terms of content, we have an ad here, we have a Navi there, we have, we have a whole bunch of sections which are not really used for anything. Okay, so this is something that we are interested in as a user, and this is something that we are interested in as a user. The, the login bars, the ads, all of that stuff is not maybe the primary focus, neither is the footer. So there's a whole bunch of screen real estate used by all these elements which the user is not interested in. So when you think about Windows 8 design philosophy, it's all about getting rid of the elements or hiding the elements that the user doesn't want to see, putting them down into the app bar, using the, the contracts and charms to interface with already existing APIs which provide you that functionality so that you don't have to reinvent a way for logging in into your application. So you just, let's say you have a login prompt, you hide it into your settings, into your settings contract, so into your settings charm. That way what happens is that the user knows where to find those things, but they are not at the screen. So learnability and and uh, usability increases drastically. So on the next screen, we see the same application converted to the Windows, uh, same website converted to a Windows 8 uh, store application. As you see, some of the same sections are there, but really they are, they are aligned in a grid. They, you have a lot of white space, and the white space just basically takes your eyes and, and focuses them on the content. So that way you you know what it is that you're interested in, so you can easily just swipe through it and, and get access to it. So consistency and uh, some of the grid things that we're going to be talking about in a, when we're talking about pride and craftsmanship, but already to, to, pay, uh, to attract your attention, we, s we see consistent use of white space throughout. So sections are grouped closer together, not by visual elements, not by lines drawn around them, but by just using white space. So the things that cling together, they're closely together. The things that belong to different categories or different collections, you put a bit of white space between them, to separate them. And here we just have the same app without the, without the annotations. So I think we can really skip this slide. So pride and craftsmanship, if that's something that Marcus can tell more about. Yeah. Um. As I talked briefly about before, pride in craftsmanship is really you as app creators being the craftsman of, of the experience that you give your users. Um, much like a carpenter creating a chair or, or, or something which is very ancient in a way, but, but it, it is really the, the creation of, of a new thing. Um, and what it contains is, is we, we really need to pay attention to the details, just as a, as a carpenter creating a chair would, would really smooth and, and uh, sand the surfaces, not, not for the um, user of the chair to, to kind of get a, get a splinter in his finger or something. We really, really need to polish our application to, to uh, give the best experience. Um, one other thing is that ap the application should be safe and reliable. Um, the user should feel confident in, in using the application. It works just as any other um, Windows 8 application, it, and it works as the user expects. Um, 
and that's something we should strive for to have confident, confidence in our users. Um, symmetry and balance is another key thing uh, that, that aligns to the grid of the um, Windows 8. Um, everything is, as you saw in the previous example here, grouped the same way. Um, the navigation, it's almost like navigation is put into the content. The user has a task and they're looking for a specific content and, and they find a group of the same stuff. And if, if they feel that they're not satisfied by by the food food category, as we see, saw in the previous example, they can drill down and find other cat categories of food. So it's really a task-based thing where you find chunks of content and you, you navigate by them. Uh, the typography is also something that that we should pay great attention to. Uh, we're uh, we have a set of uh, of typography examples, size and weights. Um, that we can go by, um, the Sego UI here, and this is something we should, should strive for, um, for using a, as far as possible. Um, and also you see a few examples here, when, when uh, for Hoover State and Press State, the Hoover State doesn't exist in the touch, touch environment, but, but the Press State really gives the user feedback, even in, in the fonts, is this is this item clickable? We can have clickable fonts, but or headlines or or content font, but it doesn't need to be. But if you if you have a press state, you, you give the user a feedback that something is happening. This item is clickable, and so on. Um, also, something we should talk about here is if you if you're creating an application for a brand that has a very fixed brand graphical profile and they have their own font please go ahead and use it but try to try to keep the same style as we have by default in operating system so that the user feel confident in in how the application works here we see an example of of the the grid um, and the grid is it's a pixel grid you never see it really if, if you're just using Windows 8 but if you fire up Photoshop, uh, you can enable the grid, uh, or if you use Blender or Visual Studio, you, you can see it. Um, and it's it's subdivided by five pixels. So so five pixels is one subunit, and then we group them together. So they're 20 by 20 pixels is one unit, and this is what we base the grid and, and the um, white space in application by. So five pixels is really the smallest unit you could think about. So if there's a takeaway from, from the grid, when you design an application, don't have widths or paddings or margins such as 393 pixels. Just make sure that you always have them in multiples of five. And uh, the recommended unit for dividing elements is really 20 pixels or 20 pixels and multiples of that. Yeah. And that's something we see here as well. So the margin from, um, and we can see the grid here as, as a raster in the background. So we have on the, on the left side, we have six uh, times 20 pixels. So uh, 120 pixels margin to, to, the, um, to the left of the application, which is uh, a system default and something that creates this kind of Windows 8 uh, template. I mean, the experience you see in most applications. And then we see the, the uh, application header is also the same, um, something we try to keep in the same position th throughout your application to, to um, have a consistent um, consistent. And every other, every other application does the same. So really, you, you don't have to memorize of all of that. And it, it might be, in a, way, in a way, tedious to remember all these pixels. And you don't have to. Uh, you can look them all up in uh, Windows Design Guidelines, so design.windows.com and some of the other links we're going to share with the material for, for looking the, these things up. But really, please do remember when, when you design your app that you align them in a way that is consistent with Windows 8 UI guidelines. And in the next slide, we can see some of the spacing examples. Yeah, exactly. Here you can see that we have a very consistent um, white space between groups, between list items, between um, 
images and so on, and it's all based on on the grid of of 20 pixels. Pixels. Um, in some cases, we have half uh, a unit of of um, spacing between, um, say, between these kind of small areas. So this is something you should try to use consistently when you're wireframing or or building your application. And you maybe want to also resist your urge to. I mean, I, I know I've had it myself that, okay, I have a limited screen, so I want to pack as much there as possible so that everything is available and you don't have to scroll or pan or... or but that's, that's, not, that's not the thing because uh, the swiping gesture is such, is such a easy thing to perform. Uh, users have learned how to scroll in, in websites and they have learned how to swipe in tablets and that's pretty much the first thing they do. So don't be afraid to have to use that white space and to have some of those elements hidden behind the fold, uh, just give hints that there's something more so. In the news application we sh showed previously, you saw the content slightly just flying in just a little bit from the right side, and that gives that animation gives user a hint that there's more to come from the same location, from the same direction, and that's used consistently in uh, well-designed apps. And, and then combined with the grid and white space, even though you don't see everything at the same time, you, you can still navigate the content. Yeah, so uh, about being fast and fluid, there's just something that I, I just mentioned, that you use animation not to impress the user, oh, this is such an awesome explosion, but instead uh, you know, it gives hints to how you can use the app. And maybe, maybe we can even show, show some of these animations and to give you the give you the picture from the from the tab <sighs> okay so basically <laughs> so so basically we can uh, okay I'll just go to the start screen and show how to select some uh, let's say you want to select several tiles so what you really do you just swipe downwards and you have animation so I swipe down something happens immediately I want to unselect it I swipe back so also when you when you press on something, it actually tells you things. It responds to you immediately. So what did it tell me? It told me that if I would swipe it down, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get selected. So I tap it. It teaches me. There is a slight checkbox on top of it. So, okay, so obviously what you need to do to select it, you need to swipe it down. So I do it, I do it very quickly now. So I don't, have to, I don't have to do it slowly. There's no timing in the in these interactive animations, there's no difference whether you do something for one second, two seconds, three seconds. It's the action, the, the gesture, which, which matters. So I swipe from the edge, I get, I get my charms. And that's, that's also an animation. So it's, it shows you the direction from which it's emerging. So if you go back to the news application, and I just, let's say, so it, it's slided slightly, just maybe four or five pixels from a side. Uh, when, when I just went to that collection view. And, and same thing happens here. There's a little bit of animation coming from a right. So, okay, there's more stuff at the right. And that's the same principle as Windows Phone 7, Windows Phone 8, Windows 8. So these design principles, they're really familiar to all of you who have used Windows, win, uh, latest Windows devices and developed for them. But when developing your own app, the use of animation is something that it's good to keep in mind. You sh it's, it's not something that you do over the top. I mean, obviously, you can do like crazy stuff and, and you, can, you can animate easily in Blend and, and then you can just get carried away and, and do stuff which you don't, don't really want to do. So to animate something in Blend is really easy. I can actually, if I manage to get my thing open so so let's say you have let's say you have something here and you you want it to move it's it's really easy to do it and for those who have developed for silverlight before and for those who have well actually I have already added it here so basically in a blend design view you can just set keyframes so what you have what you have is you 
you take an element, you, you, you drag it around, and you place a, in, on a timeline, you just place a marker. So that's, as e that's how easy it is to, to create those animations. So in a way, it's not about being technically impressive when you, when you make those animations. It's about the user interface meaning of those animations. What does it mean when something moves? It, it, it's not there to impress the user. It's there to, to give them a hint, an indicator of something about to happen, of content coming from a certain direction. So you really bring life to the experience. You, you're not trying to be like impressive in some way. You're trying to help the user. Oh, well, uh, I have the bottom bar, but I guess it's, it's weird. I'm gonna try to get rid of it. Yeah, that's better. So what else? You want people to, you want people to explore your app. So, by giving them hints, by telling them what's happening, you want to give them feedback. You want them to learn more. And as Marcus mentioned earlier, it's really about fueling that sense of exploration and and finding out how something works. So that even though you just get a, you know, sparsely populated canvas, people want to delve deeper into that app. They want to see what more features you have, what more content you have. So by, by having it responsive, by having it alive, you can have that interplay between you and the user. And, oh, touch first. That's really, that's really something that Windows 8 is, uh, in, in, is a first in a desktop family of Microsoft operating systems that it embraces the touch first metaphor. What it really means is that when you start to develop your app, you first start by catering to the touch users, to the touch input. You, have, you make sure that the touch gestures are supported for every interaction. At the same time, you cannot forget mouse, keyboard, pen interfaces. So for every, every single thing you do, for example, you saw, you saw the semantic zoom uh, happening on, on a tablet. But if I, if I fire up uh, an app, let's say I fire up the cocktail flow on my, on my desktop, I was looking for Angry Birds inside the cocktail app, and I didn't find them. So I'll just fire up it again. So we see the same start screen, but I can actually use a keyboard, a keyboard and, and mouse to do, to do the actions. And now I just realize that I don't have mouse. But what you can do, you can access the semantic zoom by pressing control and scrolling up and down. So you get the same same behavior as you get when you pinch uh, with touch. You get the same behavior with, with mouse and keyboard. Or there's also keyboard shortcuts for snapping and filling the view. So keyboard and mouse are full-fledged citizens of Windows 8, but touch always comes first. Some of the gestures are also the same between mouse and, and touch, which is quite fun. Right. So that's, that's something that we went through and make sure that even though you target potentially primarily the tablet users or the touch device users, make sure that you support mouse, that you support keyboard. It's a, it's a good, good idea to remember to do that. And uh, as we just saw, whenever you try to interact with any element, if it's an interactive element, it's going to give you a hint that it is interactive. It's going to move around a little bit to indicate that something is about to happen. So that's something that we already talked about, that you really, animations are easy to design and blend, but what really matters is how you, how you do them, and you don't overdo them, and you follow the design guidelines when you do those animations. And this is something that I think Marcus can talk, us, talk more about, is that the touch, even though you think it's a slab, it's, you know, it's a rectangular area, not all areas on a touch medium are equal citizens when it comes to reading ability and touching ability. So different areas of the screen are best for different purposes. And that's one of the reasons why Windows 8 app bar and the charms are placed where they are and they're, they look the way they look. Yeah, so here's an illustration um, about where to actually place your content uh, for it to be as visible as possible to the user. Imagine yourself holding a tablet with both hands. Uh, 
this is going to be areas that's covered up by fingers, um, especially if you, when you start interacting with buttons or elements on the screen. And this is something we can have as reference when, when uh, placing our most important content on the top of the screen, where it's rarely covered by any hands um, while interacting. And the same goes with when you have your tablet in, in portrait mode, it's going to cover not the same area, but still you're going to have covered areas where you shouldn't place the most important content. And we have the same kind of illustration here uh, showing of interaction areas uh, where to place the most important interaction buttons or, or tappable elements. And this varies quite a lot from, from landscape mode to portrait mode, as you can see here. Um, and it's something we see when, when using um, the app bar, for example. I can fire up the yeah, I, I can, yeah. test example here. So if we fire up the browser, um, I am connected. Okay. Uh, so here we have, in the bottom of, of the screen, we have um, all of the most important interaction items, the, the um, address bar and all of the back and forward buttons. So, so this is a good example of, of how you should, can place your elements when they're essential to, to the user to actually navigate your application. I mean, it's one of the first, I think, I haven't seen a tablet or a touch device browser with the address bar positioned on the bottom by default. And once you think about it, it's such a no-brainer. They what, what other manufacturers or browser makers, they did, they just, in their tablet versions, they just blindly copied the desktop browser interface to put the URL bar on top. But this way it makes so much more sense because when you, when you really hold your tablet, your thumbs are usually on the bottom. It's so much more easy to not have your hand block all of your screen when you type. And it's a little thing, but it, it uh, makes a lot of difference in the end. And then we're having a sneak peek here of the Windows 8 Touch language. So we have a set of, of defined actions you have with Touch that you should try to stick to as much as possible. And as you can see here on the screen, we have the, uh, on the uh, left top corner, we have a tap action, which is the absolutely most primary action in Windows 8. You tap to open a program. You tap to highlight uh, s some input area. And you use it all the time. Um, next to that one, we have the press hold to learn. Um, and I, this can, is I can maybe demo them also on the, on yeah, the tablet sure. at the same time. It's what Otto showed before. When you tap hold on one icon or item, it's, it's going to hint to you what, what's, the, um, what's the action there. And if it's, say, link, you can place a little tooltip box that, that shows the URL or something like that. And it's something we can use throughout the user interface to make it more clear uh, when user asks for uh, more information on what they're doing. So Pinch, you already saw it's just this very, very, very simple gesture. What else we have there? Yeah, we, have, we have the swiping action, uh, which is what we use all the time as well to swipe these kind of panoramas. Um, we yeah, well, yeah, that, yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. We have the select action, as you can show here as well. So it's just pulling down, and, and as you see here, if you pull too far or too fast, it's going to loosen the tile in this case. Uh, and same, same action for unselect, so all, all actions are reversible in Windows 8. So for, the same, for every action, there is equal and opposite reactions, <laughs> which is just using the same gesture to get, yeah. to get back. We have the swipe from bottom to, to uh, put up the, the um, application bar. That's also the same. Um, in, in all of the applications. We have swipe from side, swipe from in, in the right corner of the, um, the screen, uh, which brings out the charms, so you can interact with the system, system functionality like search and share. So right, co right corner of a screen is when you're using a mouse, there's a gesture, and when you're using a, when you're using a tap or your finger, then it's, then it's just from the side. So there's an equal equal sort of gesture, equal movement to get access to the same elements by using mouse and by using touch. And uh, really here, if we I'll just quickly show BBCs again, and then, then if we swipe from bottom, 
we again get a app bar, but it's a different app bar than you have in a start screen, but it's in a consistent location. It's in a in a in the same place, so the users know where to where, when to expect it. Yeah. So, let's move on to authentically di authentically digi digital. It's hard work. Yeah. So that's that's actually an interesting one, because what what does it really mean to be authentically digital, and can you be unauthentically digital? But what it does mean actually when you think about it is that you you break away with the abstractions and paradigms that are familiar to you from the physical world so you don't talk about desktop you talk about the start screen because it's a it's a screen on a device it's it's not not a desktop on a physical surface when you when you talk about you know text editor you might not necessarily talk about notepad again and and sometimes you might but really what it also means is that physical world is something that inspired a lot of user interfaces in the early days of a user interface design but right now we are already moving away from it we're living in 2013 where internet has been in most of our homes for almost 20 years so we are familiar with the digital metaphors and we can use the power of a digital language and a digital ways of thinking about things so you can have motions which interact with virtual objects you can have much more color much more feedback uh, the paradigms that you can innovate with when you think in authentically digital manner the the spectrum of those paradigms is so much more wider there's some so much more things you can do in digital than you can do in physical world 10 years ago 15 years ago the physical world was the benchmark the new benchmark is digital, so the digital space is where you innovate with what you can do, what kind of ways you can come up with to entice and interact with your users. And, okay, one aspect of being authentically digital is design, so it's you're fast, you're responsive, everything looks neat, good. You have, you have reactions to the user actions so that the application feels alive. But another aspect of it uh, is, uh, is something that we, we can think about as connectivity, of being connected to the internet, to other users, and to the cloud. So just having SkyDrive accessible uh, as one of your physical drives, or being able to share through the share contract from most of your apps. So all of a sudden, the internet becomes an extension of your app. And that's one thing that is only exclusively possible in digital world. So for storage, for interaction, think about how you can incorporate cloud services, uh, mobile services of Azure that we saw today uh, in a keynote by, by Tim O'Brien and, and uh, Yuka's demo. So that's, those, those are the things that you can think about when building your apps. And then we have the font yet again. Um, the Sego UI font is also authentic, authentically digital. You would think, like, what's the big deal? It's just a font. Yeah, but it, it is really designed for the screen. It looks best on, on, a, on a pixel screen. And, and um, to that one also comes the Sego UI symbols font, which has all of the glyphs that we use and see throughout the, the, um, the Windows 8. All of these symbols, w which is really clear and, and uh, to the user means interaction. So, so everywhere where, where we have uh, some kind of interaction item, think about how you can enhance that, that um, action with, with an icon. And some of these glyphs are actually part of the of the common styles uh, in in Visual Studio default Windows 8 applications, so Windows Store applications. So you can see that they are brought to you already from there. So you can check out the the common styles example, and, and there there will be properly commented. But they are actually there and in use. And there's hundreds of them. So there there's pretty much an icon for every kind of um, of, of action you would like to put there. Um, and all of them are monochrome, as you see here, so they can be used by, um, if you incorporate the brand color in your app, um, you, you can color the icon the same, uh, but still have this kind of crisp um, uh, monochrome experience. And the final, final uh, 
final principle of the five design principles by Microsoft is to win as one. So it's really about putting all the, all the other design principles together by following them, by checking out the design guidelines, by making sure that, that you adhere to the, the best practices for a touch-first Windows 8 user interfaces. That way, we can together build an ecosystem of developers and apps which follow the same design paradigms where users know what to expect and how to interact with their app. And when everybody follows those uh, design guidelines where everybody uses the, the contracts and the, and the, and the charms and, and the way you interact with your app, in the same way, that, that actually enriches the ecosystem because it's strength through numbers. If the user knows that when they buy or, or install a Windows 8 application from the store, they will always get a consistent user interface, consistent behavior. They will know where to find the features and the functionalities immediately. They will know to look for an app bar for additional options. They will use semantic zoom for getting an overview of your app. All of a sudden, you have a huge, huge, huge competitive advantage over app developers in other platforms because you have a consistent language for developing your app. So if you think of, a, of the evolution of what we had so far, we moved from the assembler to higher level languages such as C, then we have drivers that you don't have to write yourself, and then you have widgets and you, controls which you can use. And now we are at the highest level of of the standardization, unification, and sort of empowerment that we have uh, achieved so far in application design, which is standardized user interface development paradigms. And that's a very powerful concept because all of a sudden you don't have to waste time coming up with user interface paradigms or with the way you, you structure your app. All of that is given, so you just focus at the thing that you're best at. And that's where it really shines, that you are given the ability, the power to focus. You don't have to worry about you know, what your grid is going to be like or how you space your element. All of that is already designed in a very well manner, so you can focus on what your app is best at, and that's how you win. And, well, contracts. I can, I can quickly demo the search contract. That's actually where the angry birds came from because I was when trying it out. That's the example I was using. So what are contracts? Contracts are system or they're basically programmer available APIs for accessing the, the common Windows 8 uh, functionalities. And uh, the user visible side of contracts is a charm. So here we have a search charm, we have a share charm, and, and well, I'm not going to share anything right now. But just to look at the search charm, I have a whole bunch of different applications installed, and they are all listening to the search contract. And when the user fires the search event, they're going to actually know about it, and they're, they're going to offer the search results to me. So, for example, if I look for the famous game, and... I'm just gonna I'm just gonna cycle through different. I'm, I'm just gonna cycle through. The, I don't have it installed actually here, but if I if I go to store, so you see I have the same search enabled at all times. All I have to do is just cycle through through applications. Okay, what about Wikipedia? Does does it know about Angry Birds? Yes, it does. Uh, what about Bing? Can it tell me anything about Angry Birds? Yeah, it can. Do we have a TED application here? I guess I we don't. don't think we have that. Okay. Well, so you, you see it that the same search contract is used by all of these apps to deliver conceptually the same functionality but in an app-specific manner. And another thing that the, each app provides you with are search hints. So, okay, here's only one. But this green text here, that's coming straight, uh, straight from, from Bing. So if, let's say I, I misspell it, it still provides me with the same hint. So that whole API, the whole chain of interaction is actually built in into Windows 8. And you can use, as a developer, you can use it to your advantage to, to interact with other apps. And also switching between apps is really seamless. And the whole experience is, I think, it's much more holistic than on, on many other uh, similar platforms.
and it also brings the user uh, very easy access. So, so say in a user case where the user is reading about the new Angry Birds app for, for Windows in the BBC app, they can just open up the search arm, search, search Angry Birds and uh, look for it straight in, in the app, app Store. They don't need to close down the application and open the App Store for, to search for it. It's, it's throughout the system, so it's really easy access for a user all of the time as well. Well, obviously, you can also, you can also snap them. And uh, I have to admit that I've been using mostly mouse with my Windows 8, and I should have practiced my gestures more. <laughs> but uh, basically, uh, what it's all about is about giving user more power and more ability to do what it is that they want to do with your apps and no, avoiding duplicating functionalities and wasting time on that. Uh. So, yeah. Yeah, so this one, I, this is just a demo placeholder for the search charm. So, we went through all of the five principles now. Um, and as a s short recap of, of all of them, do more with less content before Chrome. Uh, focus on, on what's important. Um, pride in craftsmanship, um, attention to detail, um, nice, beautiful typography, uh, line things to the grid. We have be fast and fluid, um, so touch first, um, subtle animations that help the user interact with the application, authentically digital, um, break away from, from the physical world metaphors and be digital um, and use uh, connected environments, connect to the cloud to store states, uh, let users communicate with each other, etc. Uh, and win as one. Uh, so everything together, use what the system has built in, um, and we're going to help each other to make uh, better applications for the users. Hmm. Just to recap on these principles we'll look through, uh, we would really like to maybe run, time permitting, a quick quick walkthrough of, of how we think when designing an app, when, when creating the interface, and when sort of brainstorming what it is that we do, what, what are the thoughts that, that run through the designer's mind when, when creating a good and design com standards compliant Windows 8 app interfaces. So first of all, there's a tooling. Um, there's an excellent talk on the build, build conference in, in MSD, MSDN where this tooling is discussed in more, in more detail. But some of, the, some of the dichotomy that comes is that you have Blend and Visual Studio as your primary tools. And if you've developed Windows 8, uh, Windows 8 Phone and Windows 7, Phone 7 apps, as well as Silverlight, you are familiar with uh, with Blend. So really, uh, the the Blend for Visual Studio 12 is slightly different from from older versions of Blend that, that you use for Silverlight, but it's still going to be a familiar interface for those of you who have used it. And really, the the difference is that in Blend, you use the same, you see the same code base, you see the same XAML files. You see the same properties, but what you focus on is the visual stuff, the animations the, uh, that we showed you earlier, that just basically it's very easy to make things fly around and move and ease in and out in a nice manner in Blend. So animation, transition, visual states, so for a snap state and a des um, the, the vertical and the, and the horizontal uh, orientations of the device, that's something that you can easily design in Blend. Maybe we'll show you in a, in a moment uh, how to do it. Uh, or when going through the, the states. And then uh, for Visual Studio, it's the coding end of the spectrum. So from design and animation to coding, you can, for some tasks, you use both, for, or you can pick which one you prefer. And for some tasks, one of the tools is clearly better and more, more uh, suited for, for that task. Uh, uh, to say that these are not the only tools that we are using, a pen and paper, is an excellent tool for application design. Actually, you shouldn't underestimate the power of pen and paper. Uh, it seems primitive and simple, but when you need to quickly prototype the user interface, there's hardly anything better. And then we can actually go more, more detail in how we use pen and paper when we, or similar sketching metaphors. It's all about speed in development as well, and refining what you have. 
Uh, you can start out by a thought. You can draw a thought on paper on, in 30 seconds. Um, if you feel that this is not what I'm looking for and kind of feel that it doesn't fit with what you're trying to do, just iterate again. Do a new one. Throw out the paper. It, that's so much faster, so much easier than open up a software, open up a new project and, and starting coding or, or however you, um, you feel that you do digital uh, development. But, but pen and paper is, is uh, one of the tools that I use the most when trying to map out how the application should um, go together. So basically here, here we just think about, so you see the star screen, your app is gonna, position, gonna be positioned somewhere there, so you're gonna, desi you're gonna have to design the live, live tile, and the live tile slides actually have migrated a little bit forward, so we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna come back to them in a, in a moment, but I mean, you start, you start with a start screen, that's, that's the main entry point for your app, most likely, and then, and then as you proceed, really, then what you see is, is you you sort of okay it's going to be here it's, this is where it comes from so philosophically it's in a start screen that's where it's anchored but then when you go into the app what are going to be the elements of the app what are going to be what are going to be the the things that the user will interact in the app at the same time you want to talk to other people about how they like the user interface what they think works what doesn't so to show that to show that uh, in, in, in principle, we can actually walk you through, walk you through the, the process as we see it. But before we do that, uh, we can quickly go through the types of app structure, the user perceptible app structure that exists in Windows 8. Yeah, and here's two of the most commonly used um, app structures and navigation patterns. Um, when we design our apps, it's a hierar hierarchical navigation and a flat navigation. The hierarchical one is based on on, uh, on detail views of, say, we have a news uh, application where we have one one news article. That's that's detail view. Then we move up the the pyramid here, and we have a collection of of several news articles. And in the top, we have the app hub. Uh, so, so we can move from the app hub down to category, or we can move straight into the to the detail view. But it's kind of a pyramid shape of of um, hierarchy in the, in the in the navigation. Then we have a flat navigation, which is more um, when moving sideways between different categories. Say, um, I think Atos have an example here of the um, um, the MTV3 application where where we can move. Yeah, I can fire it up. Just a moment. Where we move between different categories. So it, in this case, it's very, very fast uh, moving from different sections. And chances are that the app developer for this app is in this room. It's a, it's a MTV3 app or somewhere in this building. Uh, but this is one of the examples where you can see how you see uh, you have the hub page. So that's, that's a very sort of prevalent design principle. Most apps, they will have a hub where you are just pulled in into the, into the content. And then inside the hub, you can, you can go deeper into, into different collections. So for example, here you have a news, a news collection and then you just go there and you, you see the sort of the sub hub. So you, you're deeper in a, in a hierarchy and then you can still go deeper into hierarchies because for each each different news there's like the main news you have the 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 newest news and you have the the local homeland news so here you can you, you can clearly see a structure sort of a tree a tree of the hierarchy diverging as you go deeper and deeper and at the same time it it feels familiar at every at every level and finally when you want to see the detail detail of the of a particular news article you can get there really quickly at the same time you can go to the next news article using the navigation at the, at the same time there's there's multiple ways to do things and when designing your app you can use some of these uh, elements or you can use different controls but some of them are always going to be there like a back button button is usually a good a good idea to navigate back at the root of your hierarchy and at the same time here we have the collections, we have a flat navigation where we press the header 
and can move between different sections of the app. So, so it's really fast in moving of one of the levels of the hierarchy. I'm just testing the semantic zoom. Do you want to switch back to the? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, and here's two illustrations of how you actually navigate uh, in the two different ways. Flat and hierarchical. Um, and as I also talked about before, we have the semantical zoom here. So we have an app hub on the top um, and different uh, groups of content. And if we do a semantical zoom, zoom movement, um, it's going to contract everything into smaller sections that makes it easier to, to, um, to navigate fast in, in very large amounts of very wide panorama, or so to say. So you can very easily move from, from place to place. So I can actually quickly show show the full snapped and field field views. So basically, multitasking on on touch devices has always been uh, somewhat of a challenge, and the reason for that is that you you you, you cannot just easily hit you know Alt Alt Tab, or you you usually cannot run too many too many windows next to each other at the same time. However, uh, what you can do. Let's say if we fire up the Wikipedia app and the BBC, oh, and I don't have a network, so I'm just going to improvise. So let's say we have we have we have Wikipedia, and then I'm going to fire up BBC at the same time. So the way you multitask is by snapping, and let's see if I can get the network. Yes, I have network happening. Uh, demo effect. I'm gonna try to look from. That's. Hmm. I lost my mouse. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So we have BBC. Uh, let's let's snap it. Ah, uh, well. There's not not su no such thing as presentation without. And demo effect. I should have used the the other thing. There you go. So basically, we just have a snapped view, which is smaller, and at the same time, it's there. It's it's um, identical to the mobile view. It's it's more narrow. It's it's formatted in a it's formatted in a different way. And actually, if I press Windows dot to switch them, so you you see that the BBC News View it's the same hub page, but what you end up seeing there is a list of the same content. So previously you had pictures and text, a whole bunch of stuff, and now we have a more mobile-friendly view. So you can, in a way, you can imagine scenarios where you can multitask. So let's say you wanna you wanna look from the so there's report on on something in in BBC, so on Maldives, and then you can you know. You want to learn more about it. So, okay, it's a bit contrived example, but you can multitask in an effective way, or you can have your email and your Skype open at the same time, and you can switch between those two applications. Okay, so let's go over to the presentation. Yeah, and uh, yet another element that we have um, in Windows 8 applications is live tiles. Live tiles are familiar to most of you uh, from, well, Windows 8, obviously, but also Windows Phone 7 and Windows Phone 8. Live tile is actually a powerful window into your application. In some ways, it's just like an old-fashioned desktop icon, but it really isn't because it tells you a lot of the content from the application. So at first you think, okay, it's just a flashing piece of images, but at the same time, it's much more than that. It gives you information to the app. So if, if you have an uh, email uh, application that supports, that has a live tile, you, you have connected your Outlook account properly, uh, you will see the latest emails, you will see the meeting notifications right there on the des desktop. So 
from a news applications, you will see the latest headlines, and from social application, from people app, you will see what's happening with your friends at the moment. So all of a sudden, your start screen becomes much more than just a desktop. It's, it's a window into all of your apps, so sometimes you don't actually have to go to the weather app to look what the weather is like. You just look at the live tile, okay, it's, it's minus two and the sun is shining, and that's all you need to know. So you don't need to drill down deeper. So live tiles have different, different designs possible. You can show tabular lists, you can show columns with numbers and texts. There are design principles which apply to live tiles, so please do follow them, and there's actual uh, excellent um, guidelines on how to use live tiles in this address. Uh, the presentation will be uh, available from the, uh, from, uh, from the website of, of Tech Days and from MSDN most likely. So you can also look up all those links there for the guidelines on how to make those beautiful live tiles and make them work in a way that you need in your application. So maybe if next we could show you quickly how we, how we proceed with designing apps. So we were thinking, okay, so what kind of app does the world need? Or what, what kind of best at app, what category could you be best at and still be unique? And uh, we were going through, you know, recipe search or having like a supermarket scales where you, where you have a Windows 8 driven supermarket, uh, supermarket uh, weighing device where you can just click on picture, uh, tap on pictures of different fruits and it's going to weigh it. And then we think, okay, there actually hasn't been any comic application done for Windows 8 which would agglomerate comic content from different sources and make it uh, pleasurable to read and pleasurable to use. So just as a thought experiment, we started to, to do the design process for that. And we started out by mapping out what kind of information uh, we want an application. That's how I start most of the time. And we are still in the process of the comic app development, so we are not going to show you the final comic app. Hopefully we are going to have it, but like this is something that we just started during the weeks and started out. So this is very much pro uh, process in progress, and uh, it teaches us also a lot about how to draw these things in yeah. for Windows 8. Yeah. So. So, so mapping out content in, in a text document is how I usually, usually start by kind of structuring my, structuring my thoughts and dividing them in, in kind of sections that make, that make sense. And that maps very good into the Windows 8 um, app as well, where you have groups of, of stuff that you want kind of hold together. Um, so I started out by, by mapping out that I want some kind of comic news uh, about uh, artists and, and new strips and so on. So, so I put a de detail view here, and that's how I start my drawing process. I start with all the detail views of the content I want to show. I move up to collections, and then at the end of the day, I kind of put everything together in the, in the App Hub, as you will see later, um, that I see more as a, as a magazine um, of, of featured stuff that, that the user should be um, engaged into. So, so here's a few detail views. Uh, we have a few collection views and, and, um, and so on. So this is kind of how I sketch very quickly. So this is maybe a, I don't know, 10 minute sketch. Um, and if, if I wouldn't be happy with it, I just throw it in the trash can and start over. That's, that's how fast you can actually do when, when, you, um, when you're just sketching on paper. And here's, <coughs> here's one view of the, of the um, App Hub as I saw it. Um, and when, you, when you're designing the App Hub, it's important as well to, to, um, to um, uh, see which content parts are, are the most uh, important ones. So is, is the news important? I thought so in this case, I placed it first in the, panora uh, in the App Hub, and then I thought the, the strips was number two. So that's something you can, uh, almost like a card sorting exercise, which, which, uh, which structure and, and uh, priority they want. Mm. So I can, I can basically, we, we thought about it yesterday, so, okay, so what does it really mean? Like, how, how does the flow work between the designer, designer and developer? And uh, just as a quick, quick demo, if I can find my cursor. Uh, like, what, 
how, f how fast or how easy is it possible to do this? So I just fire up Visual Studio and took the default template and like I did this app in 10 minutes last night basically and, and it's, it's just very, 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 very quick thing or maybe even you know, less, less, than, less than that. So I just opened the default uh, grid application template from uh, uh, from uh, hey, I have to just move it over to the ah, screen yeah. so we can see it. From uh, Visual Studio. So by just, I'm not going to open the app, temp create a new project now, but just show you where you can find them. So there's the default grid template for Windows 8 is actually quite useful by default. So if you look at the grid app, it will have three default views. It's going to have the the hub page. It's going to have the the the, the sort of the, the more detailed drill down into the collection and it's going to have the actual article detail page and it's going gonna, it's gonna to create them, it's going to link them up together and it's going to use a shared common data source and in that data source you can actually quickly just throw in assets and uh, I cannot see anything yeah so in the sample data yeah so basically what I did I just took the sample data source and I'm going to drag this down because we don't need this. And just edited some of the some of the strings and added a bunch of pictures. So I have a unified data store for uh, data store uh, for the comic apps uh, built in into default Windows 8 uh, template. And we are slowly running t out of time, so I'm just going to very quickly fire this fire this baby up. And just you know, and here all of a sudden we have a comic app. And well, okay. So what happens if I click on a on a on a comic? So we have different strips. We even have a default navigation. So all of it is ready. So following the Windows 8 design guidelines is easy. Visual Studio actually gives you the tools that that are compliant with design guidelines, and you are there pretty much immediately. So this was a detail view. Now let's look. What else can we get? And we can have a collection view where you see all the comics. So all of that comes from the same data source from the same from the same structure, all I had to do was just tweak it here and there, add the items I needed, make sure that everything worked, change the icons, change the text, and voila, we have a prototype app. It's not exactly there yet, uh, but it's, it's approaching, it's really easy to do. So prototyping in Visual Studio is worth it, and it's really, it, you, should, you should do it as, at the same time as drawing up. So basically, drawing and prototyping in VS are both very powerful tools. And maybe just a very, very, very quick, very quick, if I find my, yes, so this is something that Marcus had in mind, and then obviously this is the next step, so we again, we come back to that Visual Studio project, we tweak it, and we sort of move it towards the view that the designer had in mind, so it's an interplay, so Marcus sketches something, I prototype it quickly in VS, then Marcus pushes the boundaries, actually draws it in Photoshop or whatever tool he uses, and at the end of the day, we have an app uh, which, is, which is resulting as a, as, a, as a sort of interplay between the designers and developers. And maybe just one app which I really, really, really wanted to show before we wrap up is Fresh Paint, and it tells you that you don't have to be boxy and boring, in order to follow the design guidelines. So here you have very, very nice user interface for, for painting stuff. It's nicer on tablet, but uh, uh, right click. And so this application actually uses the default Windows 8 um, components, as you see in the app bar. So you actually have what, you, what the user suspects would be in the app bar. They have the actions, the new, the camera, image, save us, so on, but to also have the selection of colors, and it's all compliant with, with the guidelines, but it doesn't necessarily need to be as boxy and as um, gray as we see in some and of the... And implements a contract, so settings. immediately you can sell, save it on SkyDrive without coding a SkyDrive saving feature yourself. It's all there, it's all ready for you. You can share it on Facebook, you can email your picture, you can, you can save it to your cloud storage, and at the same time, you have an app which looks different, which is unique, which is prop in Windows 8. This is uh, this is the best sketching app we've come up, we've found, and you know you can make a best at app 
which follows the guidelines, which is unique, which looks great, is different, and really does a good job at what it does. So I really, as a takeaway from this session, look up the design guidelines, look up the, uh, look up the tutorials, watch the demos. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes. And, and explore how you can focus, how you can be best at in your particular, particular category. And uh, we also have a bunch of links in the presentation that we urge all of you to check out to see how you can spice, spice up your apps, how you can make them more beautiful and more interesting. And uh, thank you all very much for coming. And uh, do we have any time for questions? Yuka says no questions. So guys, thank you very much. And we really hope that it was useful to you.